So now we are live. So, Welcome to the second WISCAP section on guidelines and general considerations. We will have four great talks. Uh, we are looking forward to hear them. Uh, and uh, please collect your uh, questions to the presenters in either in the YouTube uh, channels or and post them there in the YouTube channel or in the, in the Discord channel of the session. And we will then have afterwards a joint uh, uh, question and answer sessions of all four speakers. So we will we will start um, with the first talk and selecting and sharing multidimensional projection algorithms, a practical view from Mateus Espadotto. Yeah, thank you. Go ahead, please. Hello and welcome. My name is Matheus Espadotto. I am a PhD student at the University of São Paulo and at the University of Groningen. And I'll be presenting this paper called Selecting and Sharing Multidimensional Projection Algorithms, a practical view. Let's get to it. Multidimensional Projections 101. Uh, it's an important tool in the data science toolset for visualization and simplification of high dimensional data. Uh, they enable visual exploration, making possible the detection of clusters, outliers, and other patterns in the data. The challenge. Different audiences have different requirements for multidimensional projections. The practitioners, or users, want to select the technique that best covers their requirements, whereas the researchers want to develop and compare techniques with existing ones and share the results with the public. Which projection is the best? For whom? In other words, for practitioners, the question is how to choose the best DR algorithm implementation for my task. Whereas for the researchers, the question is how to compare my new DR algorithm against the existing ones and share it with the public. In this paper, we examine both questions. We identify the workflows used by practitioners and researchers and the instruments available to complete these workflows. We discuss the challenges and limitations of those instruments and we propose an architecture for a DR evaluation benchmark. Uh, in terms of requirements, when selecting a technique, uh, we have functional requirements such as the type of input data, linearity or non-linearity, globality or locality, scalability or of sample capability, many properties which are common for many DR techniques, and we have non-functional requirements such as ease of use, documentation, uh, the programming language used in, in its implementation, and its interoperability. How to gather these properties of techniques? Uh, first, we have papers, which present a technique and compare it with a few others, usually. Uh, papers are essential for researchers, but not really useful for practitioners. We have then surveys, 
which present many techniques at once, uh, without focusing too much on technical details, and which are very good for getting a technical overview of the area. Then we have benchmarks, which usually contains practical comparisons of many techniques, provide details that allow for replicability, and are very helpful for both practitioners uh, and researchers, but unfortunately are pretty rare in the DR community. Then we have frameworks, which contains implementations of many techniques at a single place, but the documentation and code quality varies wildly, and, but they are very helpful for both practitioners and researchers. Uh, bottom line is that selecting a technique is hard for both audiences. Practitioners usually have the question, where do I start my search? Researchers have it a bit more complicated. Uh, which technique do I compare against? How to report the results? How to share the code? So, workflows come to the rescue. Uh, practitioners and researchers have distinct goals, but their workflows have some steps in common. Let's see. Practitioner uh, usually start uh, at a point where they want to search for techniques. They do it typically from papers and surveys, but also from the web. They focus mainly on non-functional requirements. Then they start searching for implementations. Well, scikit-learn usually is a good starting point. It has many implementations and is very well documented. But lesser known techniques can be harder to find or may require implementation of wrappers. Uh, then they need to select the implementations. Uh, surveys provide information to check if the requirements are met. Uh, unfortunately, the documentation quality ranges from none to great, uh, and as well as APIs and performance. Then they need to test the implementations, and benchmarks provide a variety of metrics which help validate results. For researchers, uh, the workflow is a bit different. So, but the starting point is more or less the same. They need to search for techniques, but the most important requirements for researchers usually are the functional ones. Then they, they need to implement their own technique, which is a mostly independent step. They need to test their implementation, which is pretty similar to what is done on benchmarks. Uh, and the results typically are in a four-dimensional space. They have results for over different data sets, metrics, techniques, and parameter settings. Then they need to share their implementation. You can share uh, a code mainly, uh, you can share an implementation mainly in three ways. You can have standalone code, which is easily done, but might hamper adoption. You can integrate with an existing framework, such as scikit-learn, which is harder, but much better for users. Or you can have some kind of API compatibility, which in many cases is a good compromise solution. In summary, benchmarks are essential for both workflows. Having results is good, but having code is great. The ability to reproduce results is fundamental, the ability to extend the code is desirable, and having documented code helps adoption a lot. So, two examples of recent benchmarks. Uh, towards a quantitative survey of dimension reduction techniques by Espadotto, which is me, Martins, Kering, Hirata, and Telea, which was published in TVCG in 2019. Uh, you can check out the companion site for the paper uh, in the following link. And there we evaluated 44 different techniques over 18 data sets using seven metrics and a lot of different parameters for each technique. The other paper is uh, called Quantitative Evaluation of Time-Dependent Multidimensional Projection Techniques by Vernier, Garcia, Da Silva, Comba, and Teller, uh, which is being presented at, Eurovis, at this Eurovis 2020, where they evaluated 11 techniques over 10 data sets using 12 metrics. Both benchmarks meet the criteria of being runnable and extensible, but lack good documentation to ease the work of extending them. But both will be presented at Eurovis 2020, so you get to ask the authors about them, which is good.
So the proposed benchmark architecture based on both, both cited papers uh, is comprised of the, of the following. Let's see. Uh, you, have, you need to have data sets where you have some properties like number of the observations, number of dimensions, type of data, sparsity, and so on. You need techniques where you can group them by type of technique. It, it can be linear or nonlinear, global or, non or local, and other capabilities. You need metrics such as trustworthiness, continuity, shepherd diagrams, and so on. You need to store the results into a sort of uh, result database. We can use binary files such as Python pickle format or any other files such as uh, ATF5 or anything you, you like, really, as long as it is organized. Then you can create visualizations such as scatter plots, heat maps, space filling charts, and others. Then, by having everything, you can run the evaluation where you export, explore uh, parameter grids for all techniques and you run all techniques for all data sets. This proposed benchmark has the advantage of being easy to extend. It's, you can easily add new techniques and metrics to this evaluation and once the results are recorded, it's pretty easy to create new visualizations. In conclusion, uh, challenges are different for both practitioners and for researchers. Establishing a workflow can be beneficial for both. Benchmarks are good, we definitely need more of these, but they have to be coded with extensibility in mind. The proposed architecture helps achieve extensibility. And that was it. Thanks for watching. Feel free to contact me uh, if you have any questions. That's it. See you around. Thanks. but they have to be coded with extensibility in mind. The proposed architecture helps achieve extensibility. And that was it. Thanks for watching. Feel free to contact me uh, if you have any questions. That's it. See you around. Thanks. Okay. Thank you uh, for, for your great presentation. Uh, please post uh, to the audience, please post your, your questions uh, in... ...to the... Thanks for watching. Feel free to contact me if you have any questions. Okay. There is still Tom. Good. Yeah. Please. Thank you uh, for, for your great presentation. Yeah, sorry, there, there is some technical issue. <laughs> Good, so um, yeah, let's go ahead. Uh, next uh, presentation will, will be uh, the framing the challenges operation, of operational and domain usage of visualization methods Hi, from uh, Karen Bimis from Rutgers University. I'm a geologist and oceanographer who has collaborated in visualization for over two decades. I want to talk today about the challenges I've encountered that may be common to others from the ocean sciences. My paper addresses the challenges of using volume visualization methods in the domain of ocean science, but I hope my observations will apply more broadly. I'm using examples from my own work to provide a concrete context to convey my reflections on why so few novel visualization techniques show up in the ocean science community and why so many papers in visualization give little evidence for actual domain science applicability. Ocean science needs better visualization techniques than the common 2D methods because ocean circulation and dynamics problems are fundamentally three-dimensional with flow in and out of planes. Furthermore, recent advances in simulation capacity and the explosion of observational data mean there is more 3D data than ever. This modeling and data explosion should drive adoption and exploitation of volume visualization methods, but it does not seem to help. My first case study looks at the feature tracking methods developed in DeBoer Silver's lab. 
Since the initial papers in the late 1990s, these methods have been implemented and re-implemented several times, generally to accommodate changes in the user's or perceived user's desired software environments. Limited overlap of graduate students and a lack of documentation are ongoing issues. But what really drives the lab is the need to keep finding novel projects that can be published. This limits the time and focus on maintenance and mature implementations. Since publications drive the lab's efforts, it is worth looking at who reads and uses these publications. Most citations are from within the visualization community. Even when domain scientists did cite these two papers, they usually didn't use the actual algorithms. The only uses of the implementations that I found were from a small number of direct collaborators. This highlights two gaps between the visualization community and the domain science communities, the gap in adoption of ideas or algorithms, and the even greater gap in the use of implementations. My second case study looks at the COVIS instrument, a sonar platform on the bottom of the ocean that is connected via telecom cable to the shore. COVIS looks at rising plumes of hot water near the seafloor. It acquires 8 to 24 data sets per day, 365 days per year. We need to be able to process and visualize the data as it streams in, as well as on demand. This kind of operational use demands robust, scriptable software that can handle data glitches while running autonomously, but does not need a complex user interface. The COVIS team uses MATLAB because of its strong signal processing capabilities, but does not use a common operating system and has struggled to track algorithmic changes driven by both science and visualization factors. My team has chosen what's easiest, even if it's not quite as effective. If you want us to choose your techniques, algorithms, or tools, then you may want to invest time in making them easy to use. In the third case study, I explored what happened with one student's attempt to incorporate feature tracking into a MATLAB application. The actual results of this application do successfully segment two plumes, apply skeletonization to capture the center lines, and estimate the plume orientation. But the code is a pain to use because the threshold is hard to change. The data loading browser requires a hunt and peck through directories every run, and the default output is just the orientation not the full structures. Even a simple exploration of use cases would have suggested different design requirements. The experimental phase where we explore the parameter space and establish a valid transfer function needs easily changed parameters. A routine analysis phase would run autonomously with a standard set of parameters. Obviously, good software engineering practices would suggest separating the parameters from the code. But beyond the particular details, this highlights the real importance of design studies. They help the developer design a good tool for the actual tasks. The fourth case study looked at the development of marching cubes. I chose this in order to talk about how users find software. This seems easy to experts, but domain specialists are often novices and may prefer libraries that work within existing tools. Another issue is how academic efforts to develop techniques should connect with commercial tools. Sustaining academic development of software and tools may need credit for more than just publications. Some issues seem common to these case studies and perhaps much of visualization and software development. Discovery, relevance, adaptability, flexibility, reliability, and sustainability were reoccurring themes across these projects. This visual framework emphasizes the connections between the themes and orders them based on how projects proceed from discovery of visualization techniques and tools to sustaining development work. In between, end users evaluate relevance, work with developers to adapt their project, connect input and output, and test reliability. Each theme comes with challenges to adoption and suggests potential responses from the visualization community. The first challenge is discovery. Assuming that potential users from other domains will just happen to find that perfect tool isn't realistic. Those outside the visualization community may not know the correct keyword for searches or what journals to browse. 
and good descriptions of what tools do are rare. EarthCube is a geoscience effort to build community infrastructure. Members of the Viz community could help with the EarthCube inventory of cyber tools useful to geoscientists, or the Viz community could build their own. The second challenge is relevance. Relevant tools and techniques connect software specifications to user tasks and can demonstrate the scientific value of visualization. Thinking about my case studies has brought me a stronger appreciation for design studies and creating use cases before starting coding. It has also made me realize that evaluation methods that can assess scientific value directly are needed. The third challenge is adaptability of code for usage. The utility of the visualization results is balanced against the effort to install and use visualization tools. Domain scientists have varied abilities, but are often less than comfortable with typical visualization environments. Realistic expectations of the intended users should guide software design. Good documentation, specifying dependencies and clarifying use, can help ease the burden for the user. In the end, either the visualization or the domain scientist will need to invest the time and effort to make visualization software easy to use. The fourth challenge is input and output flexibility. Domain scientists work with multiple inputs and outputs and need to know metadata and algorithmic assumptions. How the human interacts with the software changes between the development lab and the end user. Furthermore, good documentation tells the user how to change the input information, where the output information goes, and the information needed to interpret the output. The fifth challenge is reliability. Addressing reliability means discussing test procedures, assumptions about data, consistency of output, and validation of results. Scientists want to know if the visualization accurately represents the input data as well as if the test data is relevant to real-world, meaning messy, data. For the Viz community, this again highlights the importance of design studies, attention to documentation, and teaching incomers the best practices of software engineering. The sixth and final challenge is sustainability. Long-term development and support of implementations is a struggle for academic labs. The irregular turnover of graduate students results in gaps and failures to transfer knowledge. An academic funding model is driven by continued publication of novel techniques and applications. Domain scientists, including myself, bear part of the blame here by inadequately, inaccurately, or not at all citing the software and algorithms we use for visualization publications. The use of commercial software is even more poorly cited. It might be that DOI-like identifiers would help with the citation of software. Making domain usage of visualization software visible could be one way to persuade funding agencies of the value of visualization development. Thanks so much for listening to my reflections on the challenges to widespread adoptions of volume visualization in ocean science. I hope I have spurred thoughts or made connections that will inspire the scientific visualization community as it seeks domain science users and pursues a more sustainable development path. Okay, yeah. Thank you for that presentation. Um, we are looking forward Hello. to hear uh, the next uh, presentation in this session. It's about towards closing the gap uh, of medical visualization research and clinical daily routine. And please don't forget to post your questions in the channels. Uh, we are not receiving yet so many questions. Please do not hesitate to put your questions already online. Thank you very much. So I'm Robin Mack and welcome to my presentation about Towards Closing the Gap of Medical Visualization Research and Clinical Daily Routine. So visualization prototypes are usually developed including medical researchers and visualization researchers. They basically try out different things, test some parameters, test new visualization types, and then in the end they create a publication about it. 
here comes the problem. Most of these publications don't actually find their way into the clinical daily routine. Because for that, they need to be an approved and legal software. So some company has to pick it up and create a working software with it. So what we contributed here is that we first identified roles in medical software development processes. Then we created a software development process which integrates all these actors into a single process. And then with that we created this adapted V model we want to show you today. We also summarized the new EU medical device regulation and collected further challenges for medical software development processes. So to start off, let us look at the slice by slice method. This method is actually often used in clinical daily routine today. You only look at the pure data. So these are basically a stack of slices in a patient's body scan. And that scan usually comes from MRI or CT scans. By scrolling through there, doctors actually learned how to work with these. And therefore, they're very trained towards using the slice by slice method. Other visualization systems have the problem that they're usually very expensive because there aren't so many visualization systems and usually a lot of training is needed for the doctors today because they're not used to using these visualization systems so far. So we need more innovative systems or more training methods for these doctors as well as including the scientists into the development of these new products such that we have more of these innovative products and teaching methodologies can be created. Actors here are for example the visualization researchers, clinical doctors, medical researchers and companies. The amount of collaboration between these actors is shown by opacity here in the image. The visualization researcher for example aims to make a scientific contribution finding a solution to an unsolved or insufficiently solved problem. He utilizes prototypes to show the applicability of his idea. He interacts a lot with medical researchers, providing data sets and answering research questions. But they barely collaborate with companies as these want to keep inventions for their own products. Medical researchers, on the other hand, enhance routines used for diagnosis or treatment. So they formulate requirements for new routines, prototypes and testing systems. So when they have these systems, they're basically there to take a first test at it, look how the prototype behaves, try to find out how to correctly use it and adjust it. And they also provide exemplary data such that the prototype can be fed. For the clinical doctor, they use software products which are made by some company. These are ready to use software products and they actually make the requirements for the software products because these products need to fulfill their needs because they're working in the clinical daily routine. A suitable software will allow them to make decisions fast and reliable. They barely interact with visualization researchers due to the lack of time and missing applicability of their prototypes. They usually are teached by the companies providing the software solutions for them. For companies, they offer ready-to-use products sold to clinics. They develop a unique software solution assisting doctors in clinical daily routine. But they are more concerned about a legal frame and their profit for the product. The scientific contributions usually don't play a big role here as they want to keep them for themselves. They hire medical researchers for clinical tri-stage usually and software testing and they teach clinical doctors on how to use their programs. On the other hand, Collaborations with visualization researchers are not that common and if they collaborate, usually contracts forbid publications. For requirements, we actually didn't find a full set of requirements in medical visualization software development so far. So, we used Gilman et al's formulated requirements that need to be fulfilled in order to create the visualizations suitable for applications. 
So for app reusability, collaborative and interactive visualization techniques avoiding clutter have to be used. So medical doctors need a fast solution with as little parameters as possible. They basically want a magic button which analyzes the problem for them, tells them what the patient has and also tells them how they came to that conclusion. Visualization researchers and medical researchers want to interact and collaborate with the system, giving a lot of options to examine the data better. For ex effectivity regarding runtime, memory and use time efficiency, medical doctors need a decision to be made fast and reliable with as little hardware as possible. So companies usually try to fulfill these needs and make the algorithms very fast and cleaned up such that it can, can run on any hardware. For visualization researchers and medical researchers, they actually need a tool that can try out different things. It should have many parameters to play with. You should uh, examine the data from different viewpoints, but it doesn't have to work super fast on low budget hardware. For self-explaining, that regards software that is easy to use without a lot of background knowledge. Visualization researchers and medical researchers need a tool with a feedback loop such that they can understand their results better. Tools can be complex and have a lot of different functions. On the other hand, medical doctors need a system that is easy to use and needs little explanation, so companies try to implement them in this way. For flexibility, so let's say support of different use cases and input datasets, medical researchers and medical doctors need a solution that works for their specific data type and problem. So visualization researchers usually need to solve that specific problem. On the other hand, companies want to have a very general software tackling a lot of problems at once, so they can extend the application fields and portfolio. For correctness, as medical software needs to assist medical doctors in prediction of all kinds of diseases, all actors aim for high correctness. Processes and data here are usually affected by uncertainty, and this really has to be communicated. We actually chose the V model because it is part of the IEC 62304, which is a harmonized standard for medical device software defining minimum requirements for the software development lifecycle. It is approved by the EU and the US for the creation of medical applications. So it's more likely that the software is being approved in the EU and the US if it was using the V model during development than if you use any other model. Therefore an adaption of the V model was used here and it should also be easier to approve this new adaption of the V model. So, the V model itself basically has a planning phase, an implementation phase, and a testing phase. So, each of these steps come after each other, and each planning phase has a opposite side testing phase. So, for example, the user requirements are made, and in the last step, an acceptance test checks if these requirements are fulfilled. This comes down to every point other than implementation. Here the code is basically written. You can use this V model to have an agile software development because the V model only tells you which step uh, comes after which step, but it doesn't tell you which part of the system you're implementing has to be done when. So you can basically create some parts of the system first, implement them and test them, and then create some other part of the system implemented and then test it. So each part can have a separate cycle in the V model. But the problem here is that we actually need space for researchers. So therefore we made the adapted V model. Here we made space for the researchers on the left side. So we have the uh, planning phase, which is now split into a research and a production development part. So here the requirement analysis and the system design is made by the medical researcher and together with the visualization researcher an architecture design is created. 
Then each module in that design is planned out by the visualization researcher and these also implement a solution. It's basically like a prototype. This prototype is then tested by the medical researcher and together they create a lesson learned summary. This is not only the publication we were talking about, but also a second document which basically tells you what was working right, what are some pitfalls in the development, what should be avoided and what can be done better. Also, every part of the planning phase and the research part has a production development part on the right side. So from each of these parts in the planning phase of the research, the development part can benefit. So some of these documents can directly be taken and just be edited instead of creating completely new documents. On the other hand, also the testing phases can take the lessons learned summaries and look at what has to be tested and which of these tests has to be especially looked at. For the EU medical device regulation, which is a fundamental revision of from 2017 of the current medical device regulation, the EU MDR is reviewed since we wanted to focus on the European legislation since we are on a European conference here. So it will be in power on the 26 May 2021. And the registration for the medical devices is now done in the whole EU instead of each member state. Compensations of patients will be clear, so if you are harmed by uh, some medical device in the future, you can be sure that you know which compensations you will get from the company. Also, clinical trials are now done in multiple member states and will be analyzed in a central manner. So. You uh, have all the data from different EU member states, but you only have to conduct the trial once. And more information is now open for patients and users, so medical doctors in this case, such that you can inform yourself about the medical device the doctor will be using on you. On the other hand, the re-registration of a lot of medical devices has to be done, which takes a lot of time and paperwork. And it is very hard to establish new visualization with these. Most people talk about 10 years from the idea to a finalized product, actually. And here we want to cut down some of that time by incorporating the visualization researchers and medical researchers into the development. For open problems, there are still some we have to talk about. First, the transparency of visualization and computational approaches. So clinicians are responsible for treatment, so they need to understand the process of computing by the software, and the software needs to assist the clinician and not replace them. Second, the teaching of novel visualization techniques has to be done in multiple ways. So clinicians are not aware of novel software directly. So there's time needed to learn the software and to teach them about new concepts which are needed for these novel visualizations. So courses have to be made and promoted. Third, a platform for improving the connections of actors has to be made. Such a platform will bring together all the actors in the software development. So not only can companies find suitable researchers there, such uh, that they can collaborate on projects, but also the researchers can find a company to bring their idea to and make that a ready-to-use software. For open source policies, this could help actually by transforming a prototype to a company development style. So companies should provide a source open source development environment that can be used by the visualization researchers. So the visualization researcher will develop in the style of the company and this that will be easier to be adapted that later that on. on. And fifth, the approval of IEC 62304 as a harmonized standard of the MDR is still open. So this is one of the first steps which has to be done such that the V model and later on the adapted V model can be approved 
developed as a harmonized standard. All that being said, thank you for your attention and we will be happy to answer your questions in the question session. So now I will bring you live, Katja. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. It's quite interesting and, and very difficult in the medical field, uh, I think. So, um, yeah, we are looking forward also to questions in this respect. We already receive some. Uh, and uh, but at the moment we go ahead with the next talk on the participatory visualization design as an approach uh, to minimize the gap between research and application by uh, Stefan Jenicke. Thank you. Welcome to our talk. The acceptance and sustainable integration of new technical solutions is a very complex process. Only if users feel that the new system will give them an easy access and will save them time and make their work easier, they will continue to use it on a regular basis. If a new application is going to be successful or not, can already be influenced while designing it especially by incorporating as much information as possible on the intended use cases. Participatory design is a design process where all stakeholders like the partners, the customers and the end users are actively involved in a design process. This is something that is already employed in many different domains. In visualization, we also follow predefined development models. The nested model by Tamara Manzner proposes evaluation cycles in all stages of the development process, which is already quite close to the model of participatory design. However, also in this model, the design of the visualization techniques is done by the visualization designer. We therefore argue for a closer collaboration of the end users in a participatory design process for visualization projects. In this talk, we are now going to introduce four case studies where participatory design has already been successfully employed. Hello, my name is Stefan Jenicke. I am Assistant Professor for Computer Science at the University of Southern Denmark. And my case study is about digital humanities. The Digital Humanities is a research domain that brings together scholars from computer science and the humanities to develop solutions that support investigating quantitative research questions. They typically address large digital archives of cultural heritage objects. On this intersection, I am working closely together with humanities scholars since 2009, and in our paper on participatory design, I referred to four out of many projects I was involved in. The first of my Digital Humanities projects was Europeana, in which I developed the tool Geotemco to visually compare geospatial temporal datasets. Adoption within the project was challenging, as logic and design were not driven by actual needs from scholars of the targeted domain. This made it hard to deploy the tool and generate convincing usage scenarios for my publications. Luckily, after years of adjustments, it now aids a larger DH community as it is integrated in the infrastructure of the European Digital Humanities Project, DARIA. Another experience I had was the project Musica Profiling, which was initiated by a precise research question posed by the musicology professor Josef Focht. Regarding biographical features, he wanted to investigate the similarity among musicians thereby neglecting the inhomogeneity of the states of research about them. An intense collaborative development process began and led to a visual analytics framework consisting of three visual interfaces, which you can see here on the right-hand side. It is integrated in two digital encyclopedias for musicologists and as of now had more than 8,000 different users from over 70 countries performing more than 22,000 similarity and visual analysis concerning more than 6,000 different musicians. The nested model by Manzner aided as an appropriate basis for most of my projects. However, it misses steady feedback loops to scholars from the targeted domain 
to ensure to accurately support the intended user task. Involving the user in all decisions undertaken on the different levels turns the nested model into a participatory visual design model, which we propose as a solution to close the gap between visualization and application domain in general. With this statement, I hand over to Pawan, who will present the second case study. Hello everyone, my name is Pavandeep Kaur and I'm doing my PhD in Friedrich Schiller University of Vienna. Today, I will be presenting this case study based on my experience with biodiversity research as a part of my PhD project. The project I'm working with is PEXIS, which is Biodiversity Data Management System. The software that our group develop manages the data accumulated during field study or other biodiversity experiments. This data is highly complex, heterogeneous, and often not easy to understand on its own. My job is to make it understandable for data set search within the system or for data selection by scientists by the means of visualization. To my different interactions with the domain scientists by different medium, I have realized that their visualization usage is different. In one of my survey, when I've asked what sort of visualization tools do they often use, I found out the tools that we as visualization development users use are not even known to them, irrespective of how easy or difficult it is, whether they need a programming skill or not, all these tools are the one the statistics and data analytics are highly integrated. Because the main task to visualize the data is data analysis, and result representation, and then data exploration. However, this is not suitable for the data set that our platform gets, because ours is raw observational data that needs to be integrated and synthesized first to analyze it. Just to show you an example how diverse the data is, it comes from different sources and environment, made with different techniques and then can be observed from different patterns at spatial, temporal, taxonomical level or to show interactions among each other. Therefore, an appropriate tool should understand the community and the domain well, the context of the data in hand well and the information in the data set well. This leads to the creation of biodiversity visualization recommendation framework where the main knowledge is included at different levels of the system, which I have gathered to different participatory studies through literature review of biodiversity publication and by using NLP techniques to gather the context of the data. Thus, all interactions with the community and accumulation of domain knowledge has significantly impacted my current work. Thank you. Thanks, Pawan, for this interesting reflection. The next case study on sports analysis will be presented by my master student, Pavel. Go ahead. Hello, my name is Pavel Kuzmicki, and I'm currently a master student of computer science at University of Southern Denmark in Olsense. At the moment, I'm in the final stage of my master thesis that involved a project done in cooperation with Danish Football League. During the development of the project, I closely collaborated with football domain experts. This had a great impact on the final outcome of the project. The project was supposed to be split into two parts, synchronization of events and enrichment of the data. The first part was well defined from the beginning. I was working with two datasets that I was supposed to merge and synchronize in time. The two datasets were event data and tracking data. The enrichment, on the other hand, was vaguely specified. At the beginning, the representatives of the Danish Football League told me that they will need to think about what needs to be done in this part. The first draft of the project assumed that the second part will include an extraction of some high-level features from the datasets, something like left-wing attack or high-pressing. This was supposed to be done with machine learning algorithms. 
However, when the time has come and we were about to start working on the machine learning part, the representatives of the Danish Football League informed us that in fact they will require a little bit different task to be implemented. The new tasks involved detection of new events, currently not specified in the event data, and implementation of some meaningful visualizations of the football statistics. Here, for example, you can see passing networks and a chain of events that led to a goal. Overall, the close collaboration with the Football League representatives was crucial in successful delivery of the project. Thanks to the participatory design process, outcome was suitable for their needs and they weren't unpleasantly surprised by the resulting application. Thank you. Thank you, Pavel, for summarizing your master thesis in two minutes' time. Our last case study is presented by Johanna. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Johanna Schmidt. I'm with the VOVIS Research Center in Vienna in Austria, and I'm going to present the fourth case study, which is on data science. Data science has become its own emerging and very important field in research and in many applications. So whenever there is data to be understood, data science has become more and more important. The way how data scientists work and the way how the data science workflow is built has become its own um, important research field in visualization. And in many studies, it has already been found out that the workflow might be categorized into certain steps, but that it is also highly interactive, circular, very repetitive, and that data scientists are used to using very several different tools on their way to reach the final goal. When working here with data scientists at the ViaVis, we found out that for them it's very important to keep full control over the analysis that they are doing. They also like to use scripting languages like R and Python a lot because they provide a lot of functionalities and libraries that they can build on. We think that an important goal uh, should be to better integrate visual analytics system into the data science workflow. What we therefore did was to create an interface between the visual analytics system we explored that we already had and the scripting languages Python, R and MATLAB. Here is a short demo video to show how the system works. So on the left side you see Visplore and on the right side there's a Python Jupyter notebook. The data can be loaded in Python and then send via a Python command to explore di directly. And then it's possible to use all the visual an analysis techniques that Visplore provides to understand and analyze the data. Whenever there was an interaction, like a selection here, it's possible to export the results to Python again. So here we can see which um, part of the data has been selected and how many data points have been selected. So only by closely involving the end users in our design process, we could design the interfaces in a way that they're really useful for them um, to better integrate our tool into their workflow. Thank you, Johanna, for presenting the last case study. Now, let's summarize. Though there are some differences in how we carried out our interdisciplinary collaborations, we brought together some suggestions that, drawing from our collective experiences, yielded to closing the gap with a participatory visual design process. The first demands us to understand traditional workflows of the target domain necessary to establish improved workflows that include visualizations to support hypothesis verification and generation. The second relates to the knowledge gap in application domains about what visualization is capable of. So tell your collaborators that visualization is more than just statistical chance. The third is early prototyping. It has been shown beneficial to approach domain users with a basic prototype even before collecting requirements. The fourth suggestion concerns black box approaches. 
In case you are applying rather complex methods, also invest some efforts in XAI to make your results accessible to and interpretable for users. The fifth concerns the situation that you have a ready-to-use tool but do not reach the larger community of the target domain. Presenting your results at their conferences makes your tool better visible. Lastly, many domains do not own funds to buy software in order to improve their workflows. Offering your tools under an open source license can lead to mutual benefits. We hope you can take home some insights on the value of strong collaborations with domain users in a participatory visual design process. Thank you for watching our presentation. Yeah. Hello to the question and answer session. I think we had uh, really great talks. Um, we have a couple of, of questions which came on, came in. Uh, let's let's start with uh, Nigel. Uh, he asks uh, uh, about the the V model that looks good, but he questions uh, if it will result in more commercialization of software so that it is more likely to be used in everyday uh, clinical practice. So this question goes to uh, let me see. Yeah, that Dr. goes Robin. to Robin. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. Let's say, well, on the on the one hand, uh, the development life cycle we see today usually incorporates that the company takes their idea and brings that to market, and that takes a really long time. So the idea here is to really take the visualization researchers and medical researchers and take the part of, well, they develop the idea and they develop a prototype. And this prototype, the insights we created from it, are then transferred to the development lifecycle of the company itself. And here it should help out uh, making that life cycle much faster so uh, they already have a prototype they already have insights what worked what didn't work and then they can work on a uh, on on this insight and make a better product faster actually okay uh so next question uh was uh from uh, christina uh, and this question goes to everybody. So uh, she asked, she, she would like to know, how does your collaboration with domain scientists looks like? Um, so what problems do you encounter and how do you present and discuss visualizations with them? I think everybody can answer to this from the presenters. Let's see, to unmute you. Yes, I think you should be able to talk. No, audio ein. So it's a bit difficult. <laughs> Bobby. I think you can unmute yourself if you want to answer. Does somebody like to answer to this question? You find it in the YouTube channel? Um, yeah, yeah, maybe I just Yes, start. I can. <laughs> So, ladies first. No? Okay. I, 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 I would then say start, Stefan. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Um, yeah, I guess um, it, uh, it depends a little on, on, on the, the research domain or the target domain you're working with. So um, I am working closely together with uh, humanities scholars uh, most often uh, and biologists 
and um, so they have a, a typically a quite different uh, background so they use a completely different terminology and so you need to somehow um, talk to them quite frequently um, uh, that you are somewhat ensure you're talking the same language and this is like uh, one of the most uh, important aspects of, of this whole um, in our case very close uh, uh, participatory design as, as in our talk and um, so I just uh, one uh, from our last or one, one of my last project the projects we submitted uh, to the BIS conference was I mean that the, the situation was quite different, but uh, my user was sitting in Abu Dhabi and we have not met in person anyway. So, but we basically had like um, two or three Zoom meetings uh, a week, and we had a very very uh, intense discussion, which mostly did not really lead to. Um, so, um, what do we need we need to change with the visualization? What uh, do we need to add a button there or there? was more or less uh, a common understanding of each other's um, tasks and interests in the project that led somehow on another direction towards improving uh, the visualization. So this um, is like uh, for us workflows, yeah. or for me, workflows are very close uh, discussions with the, with the target users. Muted. <laughs> you are muted. Uh, someone else likes to answer to this question from the presenters because it was a question to everybody. No. Okay. Good. So let's then. I could, uh, yeah. I could give a very short answer. Um, I'm actually coming from the other side. I'm actually the domain scientist. And I've found that sometimes discussions could be very productive, but sometimes people would get half of an idea. They'd only sort of understand what I was doing. And then they would go off and do the thing and they'd come back. And I like the idea maybe of the prototyping that, and thinking of it that way from the Viz side, that you're not trying to make the whole thing. You're just trying to start something so you can get a better idea of the requirements. Okay, yeah, so thank you uh, for your answers. So uh, there, there is another one which goes all also to everybody. So uh, from Nigel again, uh, in designing visualization solutions, have you considered running a design sprint? So like a five day process made popular by Jake Knapp. Is someone using something like this? I think this goes possibly mainly again Okay, Stefan, and also to Robin, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Um, should I start? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so typically, um, those uh, this design sprintings uh, are forced by by by, uh, by submission deadlines for us. But this is obviously not the best uh, way of working together with uh, target users because, especially when they do not have as they are non-experts in computer science, you have a lot of, uh, you need a lot of uh, uh, explanation cycles and you need to have a lot of interdisciplinary exchange. Um, uh, and they uh, typically, our, uh, our colleagues um, from the target domain need um, also some, some backs and forths to think about the problem. So I do not really think uh, such kind of a, uh, a fast uh, design uh, process is possible with, uh, with my target users. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, well, from my side, it's more for, for the V model I presented. Uh, the thing is that you can use agile met methods with it. So um, it's uh, not like I, uh, I use them in our um, development so far, but for the adapted V model, you can always incorporate these prints in one way or the other. You're not set to one agile method. You can actually use any me uh, agile method there because you can take 
one part of a system, you can do the system design in that way and use some other uh, agile method for the next development stage. So you're very open in this adapted V model to use any agile method you want and also use these sprint methods if you like to. Okay, thank you. Um, so let's let's go on with the questions of Renata, uh, posted by Renata Redu. So uh, it goes to Robin again. Uh, my curiosity was caught by your statement, uncertainty needs to be communicated. Is this always true? And in my experience, clinical researchers, e.g., are quite interested in uncertainty. Okay, so... Well, first of all, all I have to say, uh, as I always work with uncertainty, so most of my papers incorporate uncertainty, I might be a little bit biased. But why, what I usually find is that uncertainty yields like interesting things we didn't see before. We, uh, For example, we had some tumor data sets and we really thought, okay, first of all, you think, yeah, that's the actual size of the tumor. And after we used uncertainty quantification, we looked at uh, different different ISO values and we saw that, well, for some part you can really be certain about how big that tumor is, but for other parts you're like, yeah, that could be some tumorous part in the other part of the brain, but we actually don't know. So uh, even if some people think they're not interested in uncertainty, uncertainty can really yield some problems they didn't see before. Okay. And, and uh, it continues, actually, yeah. clinical doctors do not want anything to do with it as it makes decision making more cumbersome for them. Could you please share your own experience? Okay, this you did already. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, but from a practical, that's a question for myself, which follows up on this. Uh, what do you think is really, or how many of these uncertainty visualization things are really in, in clinical practice at the moment? How many are used or could you state on application areas where you see where this uncertainty visualization is really in clinical practice now? Well, uh, you have to see that usually we take about, well, 10 years from the idea to a finalized product. And I don't know if 10 years ago, like a lot of people were looking into medical applications using uncertainty so far. So I, for me, it's more like a hope that in 10 years from now, we use a lot of uncertainty where applications and medicine, but I don't think that a lot of uh, uncertainty where applications are used today in medical uh, daily care. Okay, thank you. So, so uh, I think we can put uh, Alex uh, Telea uh, in between. Uh, do you want to ask your question by yourself? I can. Yeah. Um, hi, thank you. <coughs> uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so uh, this is a question directed to to everybody, and I'm trying to to, to summarize it briefly. Um, what strikes me is that this, this gap uh, issue is not new. So I recall that at a panel at InfoVis 2000, we, we discussed pretty much the same thing. Uh, however, I don't see uh, how we have advanced towards solving it fundamentally, because for me, the problem is that what we are aiming at in the academic community is different kind of beast. It's it's a different business model, if you will, than what practitioners really aim at. So as I see software, view software in particular becomes more and more complicated. So harder and harder to, of course, understand, deploy, learn. Uh, so the this gap seems to increase to me rather than decrease over the years. So with this in mind, how can we, as a community at large, expect to close this gap in the future if it only gets larger. Back to you. So does uh, someone answer to this question? Yeah, Robin? Uh, well, I, I think the, the 
biggest problem is that for many of these visualizations we have today, the teaching methodologies are actually missing still. So I guess in closing the gap, we really need to have new teaching methodologies for different kinds of applications. Like for medical doctors, we need specialized teaching methodologies, teaching them how to use these visualizations. Also tell them, for example, why they, do they need uncertainty? What can they discover with uncertainty or with other visualization methods? So when we do this, this is how we could close the gap a little bit more by telling people how they can use these methods instead of just giving them the uh, visualizations and telling them, oh, just use them. Someone else? Yeah, Stefan? Um, I started working uh, in interdisciplinary collaborations like 10 years ago. And um, what I found from the beginning on was that, um, I mean, interdisciplinary collaboration uh, uh, costs a lot of time and efforts. And um, I, I am not sure if this is really valued in, in the, the publication um, policy we have at, at this. So um, typically we are following or we want to, to publish a new method. And, uh, but um, there is a, a tightrope to, to, uh, to, to yeah, generate benefits on both sides. So for your cooperation partners to design something that is really of use to them. And on the other hand, to uh, generate some valuable uh, output for me as a researcher that I can um, that I can publish uh, some new method. And I guess um, maybe it, there would be a possibility to somehow value this uh, this interdisciplinary effort, um, which is necessary to close this gap. And I, I don't don't think I mean I was not there at two thousand uh, Infobis, but I, I heard that that the problem exists even longer. Um, so um, I think um, uh, if if we would value this uh, a little more, then uh, then the, the gap would close uh, would be closer automatically. Yeah, I can just uh, add to this and fully agree because uh, I mean, if you are working in a practical environment and you really want to develop solutions for users. Sometimes they just don't care about design considerations. <laughs> yeah, this is really like uh, they they uh, want to have it sometimes as simple. And I think the 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 major uh, contribution is to find out what is really the perfect way in using the visualizations, which methods, which are there to to really improve their workflows and or enable their workflows yeah and not so much in in this yeah stefan i guess another problem is i mean we are not paid for maintenance so we are paid for for uh, getting uh, for making research output and um so um there is i mean it's uh, it's a lot of effort to to maintain maintain uh, uh, solutions uh, to to be accessible for a uh, long life to to the target domain so this is i mean uh, still a problem and i guess most of the universities do not have the the, the fundings uh, to uh, for for maintaining for, for maintaining uh, those uh, kind of results mm -hmm. okay thank you so let's see what else do we have that's a question again to stefan and co-authors from christina uh, what are problems, workflows, solutions that are independent from the application? Um, maybe I just start, but, but there are other, uh, other uh, co-authors in, in, in the loop here. So um, I think um, many of us somehow realize that, um, that there is a knowledge gap between uh, what visualization is capable of. So there, um, so many uh, collaboration partners do not um, are not aware of, uh, of what is possible. Let's say uh, there is a, a, a few pre pre present results in form of statistical charts. Uh, that's like uh, the state of the art, I would say. So, but uh, making them aware of uh, what is possible also generates some some or triggers some some ideas of how how data could be 
uh, visualized differently and maybe how what information could be protected. Um, yeah, th this, for instance, but we list some other things in, in the paper. So, but maybe part one, if you want to uh, add something here. Yeah, sure. I was looking forward for that. Um, uh, hi. Um, so I work with biodiversity scientists for around four, four or five years now. I have realized that there is a big knowledge gap, which Stefan has um, also just mentioned. And I feel that uh, why can't we start from a domain specific solution and then go at high level with more generic so then it would have it would able to fulfill the needs of that particular domain yeah and then we add on top of more examples that can be suitable for other domains so in my knowledge I would I, I have seen that the, the software tools that biodiversity scientists or ecologists use, um, with the visualizations they are well of, aware of are very tightly coupled with their uh, domain itself. They, they, they are biostaticians, so most of the time they use their software more for confirmatory analysis than exploratory analysis. Uh, and um, so the, I feel the tools should, should be domain specific, and then we need to add a layer on top that how it could be used in other applications. Thank you. Okay, uh, I think Karen, you wanted to say something or did I misinterpret that? <laughs> yes. I guess I, this one is sort of two things. One is that I would really, I would actually support Pollen's idea of starting with the domain specific where you can really um, focus on what people are actually doing a real workflow or a real question or a real need and then move to the generic. And I think most of the development has probably been the other way around. Mm -hmm. um, but I also wanted to say to one of the earlier questions that I think visibility is an issue. I'm very familiar with the visualization world because I go to these meetings and have been doing so over a long period of time. But most of my colleagues in geology and oceanography they don't. And so they, you know, they don't understand even why an isosurface is more complicated than a slice through a data set, let alone any of the other things that are out there. Um, I don't know how to solve the problem, although education tools that Robin Mack suggested might be one approach. Mm -hmm. do, do you think that uh, invited session on sessions of visualization specialists at some domain conferences would help, for instance, or the other way around? Um, I think that actually is a good idea. I thought about that for some of the stuff that I work with, it taking it into the oceanography community. Um, it's challenging and, and maybe looking for mechanisms to do a tutorial type session rather than a talk session would draw more people in. Um, you know, if you just sort of put a talk out there, there's not, you know, because there's not made up sessions. Hello, I'm Robert. Or you'd have to be willing to propose, you'd have to have a connection where you're proposing a session. Otherwise, you just don't have the visibility. Okay, okay. Okay, Stefan? Um, basically, we did this with the visualization for the Digital Humanities workshop at the, at the this week. So um, we have this uh, four iterations now, and uh, this is a platform where also humanities scholars can, uh, can participate. And um, I guess this year we are also having a workshop at the Digital Humanities Conference, which uh, brings visualization scholars to uh, the target domain, so to say. And I think this is uh, one uh, important aspect of how to bring communities closer together and to to um, yeah bring them uh, at first into discussions and uh, and to collaborate with each other instead of just developing something and then trying to do, um, outsource it to the core deploy it to the community mm -hmm. and on on the long long run I mean this would also mean that uh, if, if as a visualization specialist that your publication in domain uh, in different domains, let's say, is also acknowledged or I mean, this, this would help, I think, that goes to, to the question of Alex 
where I, I would say, I mean, if I publish in other domains, not only at uh, IEEE TVCG or at WIS, yeah, but also in, I don't know, in the oceanography uh, community or whatever, or in the medical community, that this is also a, a value, yeah. Okay, so uh, there, there is another question uh, from Gabriela Molina Leon uh, at Stefan again. <laughs> uh, so, how was the adoption of your systems after publishing your research? I feel that a big challenge is the technical effort and time required to keep the system running. Yes. <laughs> It is so, but uh, I can answer or reply this question uh, differently <laughs> because there were just different scenarios. Um, so, first, uh, it's important to note that most of my uh, developments are in, in JavaScript, so they are running in the browser. And um, of course, <laughs> sometimes I, I do not have the time anymore to care about all the things I have been developing in the past. Um, but uh, in the beginning, I just uh, made them available on GitHub and some of them, uh, some other researchers or projects uh, made use of them, um, which is one solution. Another solution is uh, to just provide, um, yeah, um, accessible web pages where uh, prototypes are running, which is possible in some cases, not for all. Uh, developments um, and sometimes um, so linking uh, linking in existing uh, encyclopedias or web pages uh, is also possible, but uh, this all takes time and um, it's not. Um, so I think um, looking back, it's probably not the uh, best solution just to uh, to provide a, an open source GitHub uh, repository because uh, target users are not familiar with um, the running code themselves and uh, so better uh, what is possible uh, just provide some 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 links uh, in the internet but yeah there are different approaches and there's i guess no um yeah no best solution it i guess depends on um yeah on the expertise uh, in yeah, making code running uh, from the target users Mm -hmm. Also, maybe a quick comment from my side, if that is okay. Yeah. So, I think we should keep in mind that uh, funding agencies are slowly starting to consider the position of research software engineers or whatever they are going to be called. I mean, that kind of depends on the country you are looking at. But this is actually something that is slowly coming up and it might be a great opportunity in the near future to get additional funding to actually invest in maintaining your software a little bit, at least medium term. So long term uh, funding is still a problem, but there are things coming up in the UK and Germany as well. So I guess this will extend to other countries uh, in the medium term. Yeah, and I, I can also maybe add my experience in this field. We are developing also software a lot with users and uh, one possibility to get funding uh, if you are not applying for, let's say, computer science research, but if you go into an interdisciplinary project and and um, your colleagues apply from the applied uh, from the applied area or from the uh, domain application domain, and you just jump on the train and say, "I want to develop software for them," then it's also I I was successful in getting their money just for software developers in extending our software then to the application domains and to make it more stable and to extend it. So that, that is one strategy you, you can also consider to go. So there, there is a, a last question uh, from uh, Damian Hatik uh, at Robin. So uh, should uncertainty be something that is put as a burden on the clinical practitioners or should the implications of uncertainty be handled in the domain of medical researchers? So for me, that's more like a mixture. So in a perfect world, I would say we would need like a medical visualization doctor. He would be the one carrying this burden 
of looking at uncertainty, looking at all these visualization methods. He's basically the one taking the pure data, processing it, and giving it back to the radiologist. So this way, we wouldn't have uh, either way. More like we have a specialized person which takes the burden of looking and knowing everything about how these visualization systems works. He processes this data and gives uh, like an analysis of the data back to the doctors in clinical daily care. And they can then use these uh, processed visualizations and directly see what the problem is without, well, completely understanding how the uncertainty behind that works. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, there was at the be very beginning another question from uh, Nigel uh, about all radiology departments have 2D and 3D visualization platforms, however, yeah, they are not so uncommon. So I think this, this question goes a bit in the direction where, where is visualization uh, in, 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 in the medical domain still an issue? Where, where is that still needed? I mean, the basics, they are all done. They are available in the workstations. Um, for radiotherapy planning, there are already quite advanced visualization workstations. You mentioned uncertainty as one one uh, domain where still stuff has to be done, but really in the clinics, in the radiology, where do you see uh, still open research questions for visualization? Uh, well, what I often see, uh, I've, I've been to Medica, that's one of the biggest trade fairs for medical software and hardware. And when I meet radiologists there, they usually, well, especially the older ones, they're used to still use these old methods, or if they have new visualization systems, they barely use them, even if they're there. So what I would say is, for the older um, practitioners there, it would be good if we had new teaching methodologies such that they can easily learn how to use these visualization systems. So we need more training courses. And for the new um, practitioners, it's more likely that uh, we should also incorporate that into their studies already or into their first years of um, medical experience so in the first years you should learn how to use these visualization softwares and then also uh, get an overview of what is uh, already available and give them also updates on uh, what will come up in the next years okay so i have a last we still have four minutes to go i think so i have a last question uh, also to mateus uh, it's about, uh, you talked about your benchmarks uh, and your benchmark proposal for a specific problem. Uh, I mean, I see that in the WIS community, uh, challenges in respect to software are not so common because I also move around in the, in the uh, image processing community. So there it's very, very common to have challenges you have a specific problem and, and you have to, you are really comparing the performance of certain solutions uh, in, in, a, in a given framework. Do you think something like this would be really possible in, in the WIS community and, and for which uh, problems? I mean, you mentioned one, this was this embedding or mapping problem. Uh, but do you see other, or how can that be set up in a good way? Yeah, I, I think the, the main problem is having good metrics to be able to, to evaluate all of those benchmarks, all of those testing uh, in an automated way. So in the case of uh, multidimensional projections, this can be more or less easily done. We have uh, tons of metrics to do this. But in the cases of things that, in, in case of this visualizations where things are more perceptual, uh, they maybe are not so easily uh, uh, measurable. 
that that's the the point I'm, I'm trying to make. So, but 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 I think I think it, it is possible. Yeah, we we did a, a great job uh, on DR techniques. We are trying to to improve on that. Uh, we are presenting. Uh, I'm presenting another paper tomorrow about our uh, our large benchmark. So yeah, I think it's mainly possible. Yeah, sure, definitely. Mm -hmm. So it would be nice to see something like this more in the future in the conferences, I would say. Yeah, and also yeah. maybe uh, it would be a good good idea to think about how we can really evaluate effectivity and efficiency of, of some visualization solutions in terms of do they really solve the problem? Yeah, that, that is an interesting question. Okay, so it's one minute still, So, but I hope, uh, I, I would like to thank everybody for this uh, great session and the uh, very interesting discussions and the audience uh, to uh, pose interesting questions. Uh, so, so I hope you also enjoyed it and uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of the conference. See you, bye. And we can close the session.